questions. Questions oral. L'honorable member for Megantic Clérable. Madam Speaker, Quebec is just on the other side of the Outaouais River, specifically the city of Gatineau. After eight years under this prime minister, Gatineau is uh, hurting the most from these uh, soft on crime liberal policies. Uh, violent gun crime has increased by 76 percent in just one year. That's the biggest increase than anywhere else in Quebec. There were 14,000 violent cr gun crimes committed in 2022. That's the highest number in 15 years. When will the prime minister finally end the at-home Netflix sentences and stop crime? The Honourable Leader of the Government in the House, Madam Speaker, I am the proud member for Gatineau, and I can say that the Conservative policies are ones that will contribute to violence in our communities if we keep guns, the measures that they firmly opposed under the eight years of this government. They are voting against any measures to uh, give the tools needed to our police forces in Gatineau and elsewhere across the country. They vote against all those measures, which will help crime rates drop. Uh, we are here, the Honourable Member for Megantic Clérable. I don't see how, after eight years of liberal inaction, the member for Gatineau can be proud that violent crime has using guns has increased by 76 percent in Gatineau. But it's not just uh, gun crime. The housing crisis is also continuing to get much worse. The situation will continue to get worse. More people will be forced out of their homes. And in fact, uh, everything is related. After eight years under this government, the, it's a disaster when it comes to housing. The block is not an alternative. They want to keep this prime minister in place for another two years. When will the prime minister stop adding bureaucracy and start building homes? Yes, it's true, Madam Speaker. There is a housing crisis in our country. But what is the best approach? It's the approach our government has taken. Uh, certainly this fall, but certainly throughout our tenure in government. Letting more homes be built in this country, putting in place serious measures to work with municipalities. In fact, we have an agreement with the province of Quebec that will lead to thousands of more homes being built. This is the Housing Accelerator Fund, Madam Speaker. Throughout the country, we see that as well. It's a, an approach that incents more building, all types of building. The Conservatives want a tax building, Madam Speaker. Exactly. The Honourable Member for Megantic Clérable. There are waiting lines for houses after eight years under this Prime Minister. He's not worth the wait at all. There's waiting lines in airports for passports, hours on the phone for an EI check. Uh, they are even waiting lists for food banks. And the Boucher Généreuse in Quebec said it's not normal that in a modern and rich society such as ours, families with two working parents have to go to a food bank. Will the costly Bloc Liberal Coalition support our common sense motion to cancel the April 1st tax hike? The Honorable Parliamentary Secretary. Madam Speaker, they say they have the backs of Canadians. I think it's interesting and hypocritical for them to point arguments like that out time and again. What did we learn yesterday? We learned that the chief advisor to the opposition leader has served as the chief lobbyist of Galen Weston and Loblaws. And today we learned something else. The opposition leader ought to get in touch with his deputy leader, who served as a lobbyist for Walmart, the grocery conglomerate. Oh, they want to talk about competition in the grocery sector. They vote against it every time. It's no surprise. You can't make it. The Honourable Member for Calgary Nose Hill. I can assure you, Madam Speaker, um, unlike these Liberals, uh, if Ms. Byrne had hauled the grocers in for a roundtable, prices would be lower by now. <laughs> uh, the reality is that the Liberal NDP coalition have nobody outside of themselves to blame for high grocery prices because of increased tax and deficit spending. This inflationary crisis is their causing. So, a simple question. Will they su support our motion to cancel the increase in the carbon tax on April the 1st? Here, here. The Honourable Government House Leader. Madam Speaker, what we see today is an illustration of the hypocrisy of this Conservative Party. Their deputy leader lobbying behind the scenes, behind the curtain, for Walmart, of all people, one of the major players in our grocery sector, and their grand poobah, 
the person to whom they all must pay, uh, homage pay absolute God. homage is, uh, it turns out, as we speak, her firm getting a paycheck from Loblaws as we debate competition in this chamber and as the Conservatives vote against every measure. The Honourable Member for Calgary knows Hill. It's, it's really spectacular to see what these Liberals will do, knowing how far behind it they are in the polls. The reality is that they are behind in the polls because they're not helping Canadians make ends meet. They're making it worse for them. What we need to do is axe the carbon tax. We need to build more homes. There is a motion in front of Parliament that would make life more affordable right now for Canadians. Will the government support our common sense motion to stop the carbon tax increase on April the 1st? The Honourable the Secretary, the Minister of Environment. Madam Speaker, an economist from the University of Calgary specifically found that if the carbon price and the carbon rebates that are sent to Canadians was cancelled tomorrow, the people who would most benefit earn more than $250,000. If we're concerned about affordability, here on this side of the house, we're looking out for the everyday Canadians. On that side of the house, they seem to be looking out for the top 1%. Excellent. The Honourable Member for Salaberry Sorwa. Madam Speaker, once again, French is being treated like a second class language in this parliament. Yesterday, the Conservatives and the NDP, with the support of a lost Liberal, decided in committee that uh, commissioners looking at potential miscarriages of justice don't need to be bilingual. Once again, these parties are abandoning francophones in Quebec and elsewhere in Canada. The justice, or justice rather, is supposed to be bilingual. Canada is also supposed to be bilingual. Will the government ensure that miscarriage of justice commissioners are indeed bilingual? Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. I'm the so-called lost liberal she's referring to. I was at that committee. I voted the way I did, and I'm proud I did. I stood up for unilingual French-speaking citizens in the province of Quebec. I stood up for English speakers and minorities across the country, British Columbia, Alberta, Manitoba, and Ontario. That commission is going to be bilingual in nature. It's going to be available for people in both official languages, and that's the most important thing in that bill. I think what was decided yesterday was absolutely right and stands for exactly the principles she is advancing. The Honourable Member for Salaberry Sawa, Madam Speaker, it's terrible what we've just heard. Once again, this Parliament is devaluing francophones on the pretext of promoting diversity. Let me repeat that. French is not an obstacle to diversity. French in this country is part of its diversity. And fr the Francophonie is diverse. That is a, a very weak argument when we talk about justice because the two official languages are equally lawful. Anyone who does not understand French is not competent to interpret law in Canada. Will the parties explain to their colleagues that, or who will explain that these make no sense? The Honourable Government House Leader. I can assure the member and all parliamentarians in the House that uh, this government is dedicated and committed and has uh, full respect for the Official Languages Act in all areas of federal jurisdiction, including the administration of justice, the member can be fully reassured that French is well alive as long as this government remains in power. For North Island, Powell River. Speaker, toxic drug overdoses have devastated countless communities like in my riding. Campbell River just witnessed the worst year on record for toxic drug-related deaths, having the fifth highest rate of deaths in British Columbia. People need a plan and a federal government willing to act. But the Liberals drag their feet and offer up patchwork plans, while the Conservatives try to criminalize our loved ones who are struggling. Canada needs a health-based plan for harm reduction and treatment with a timeline. What's the holdup? Here, here. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker, and I want to thank the member opposite uh, for the question. And I agree, we agree with the member that when it comes to issues around 
uh, substance issues, addiction, we need to bring a thoughtful healthcare approach uh, to that. And that is why we continue to work with the provinces in making sure that we're bringing in a healthcare approach to people who are facing mental health and addiction challenges so that we can look after them, unlike what the conservative wants to do, which is to, uh, 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 to throw these people into jails uh, and, uh, and treat them not like humans, uh, but just as criminals, which is absolutely wrong. The Honourable Member for Port Moody, Quicklam. <clears throat> Madam Speaker, Speaker, people who took CERB in good faith are now being punished by this government. While everyday Canadians are struggling to pay for food or rent, the Liberals have decided to punish them by clawing back low-income benefits in an effort to recoup CERB money Canadians desperately needed to survive. Clawing back benefits from people who already can't make ends meet is cruel. Why are the Liberals going after families struggling to put food on the table while giving wealthy CEOs a free ride? Good question. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Madam Speaker, we have been clear from the outset, if a situation of repayment arose, we would treat all cases individually and fairly. We were also clear that we would show flexibility and recover overpayments without any interest or any penalties. To prevent undue hardship, flexible repayment options are available. Individuals can establish a repayment schedules based on their financial situation and their ability to pay. Madam Speaker, we will continue to take a responsible approach to ensure a fair process. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Red Deer Mountain View. After eight years of this Liberal NDP government, farmers and consumers know that this Prime Minister is not worth the cost. Increasing the carbon tax only increases the cost of goods in stores, and for those farmers that cannot pass on the exorbitant carbon tax, it destroys their bottom line. Will the Liberals reject the Senate's amendments and restore Bill C-234 to its original state, removing the carbon tax on farmers and lowering the price of food for Canadians? The Honourable Parliament Secretary the Minister of Agriculture. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Conservatives love to talk the talk with farmers, but when it comes time for action, they're always missing inaction. Every time they were in power, they slashed the funding for farmers, something they don't like to talk about. They slashed $200 million for farmers, money that was directed to farmers. Yeah, On this side of the House, we added 25% more dollars in our, in our agreement with province, money that's going directly to farmers. And as the Honourable Member knows, there's a partial rebate available for the issue that he's raised. The yeah, Honourable Member for Red Deer Mountain View. Well, Madam Speaker, these uh, ministers must do a lot more than just mouth Greta's catchphrases. Grain commodity prices have dropped 20 to 40 percent in the last few months. Localized drought and flooding always takes its toll, but the price drop is because prairie farmers have had one of the best yielding crops ever. But there's no more profit. Suppliers, banks and governments are the only winners. Quadrupling the carbon tax on farmers' inputs will be devastating. Will the Liberals stop playing games and give farmers the break they need? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, Madam Speaker, we're not playing games, and I wish he'd stop misinforming this House. Obviously, a, a program of farmers have faced droughts. We get that. We understand. Why? Because of climate change. 21% of grains in 2021 didn't make it to uh, the market. And there's programs in place like agri-stability. I hope the member is lobbying extremely hard to the, to the member of the official opposition to make him understand that slashing agri-stability while he was at the cabinet table was not a good issue for farmers. It was not a good policy for farmers. On this side of the House, we're supporting farmers, we're putting more money in their pockets, and we're making sure that programs, when they face droughts, are available for them. That's true. The Honourable Member for Portage, Lisbon. Madam Speaker, it's common sense. When you tax farmers for having to dry their grain or heat their barn, you're making it much more expensive to produce the food we all eat. Jim, a poultry farmer from my riding, is paying $5,000 a month in carbon taxes to heat his barn. This Prime Minister always thinks he knows best. He thinks that food just teleports to grocery stores, that it magically appears on plates, and he even thinks he can run Jim's farm better than he can. How much more does he suggest Jim should be paying to heat his barn when it's 40 below? Good the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. 
Madam Speaker, I'm always happy to rise to answer a question on farming, especially I'm, I'm glad the member raises supply management. Our government has supported supply management throughout its mandate. For, for eight years, we have supported supply management. $4.5 billion went, uh, are available for, uh, for supply-managed farmers. And obviously, the member raises an important question. We are, understand that climate change has a huge impact on the availability of, uh, of, of, of land and the, the crops. It has a huge impact on, on the on the, uh, on the on the on the profitability of farmers, we just hope that the member can lobby his leader of the official opposition to make sure that he doesn't slash budgets that are available for The Honourable Member for Portage Lisgard. You know, I, I wish we could spread answers like that on farmers fields so that at least they could benefit from some of that fertilizer. This NDP Liberal government is costing Canadians through high food prices once again showing how out of touch they are. Not only did the radical environment minister admit to pressuring senators to gut Bill C-234, but farmers are getting another carbon tax on April 1st. After eight years, this Prime Minister has proven that he is most certainly not worth the cost. Will the Liberals reject the Senate's amendments and completely remove the carbon tax from farmers to lower food prices for Canadians? Parliamentary Secretary. The member is an associate member of the Finance Committee. Yesterday, the Governor of the Bank of Canada appeared there, Madam Speaker, and made clear that carbon pricing is not a fundamental factor in inflation. But you know what is important, Mr. S Madam Speaker? What is important is the fact that we have to get behind the idea of competition. This government has put forward a measure that would advance competition in the grocery sector, and we know why they don't support it. Their chief advisor is on the side of Loblaws. That party is in the pocket of Loblaws. They're in the pocket of Walmart, it seems. Their deputy leader has been a lobbyist for them. They don't believe in competition in the grocery sector. They don't believe in Canadians, Madam Speaker. Honourable Member for Yellowhead. Madam Speaker, Bill C-234 is back in the House after Liberal-appointed senators stalled and gutted this crucial legislation. This bill is vital for exempting farmers from the carbon tax and would ease the high cost of Canadian food. But as the carbon tax is set to quadruple, farmers will pay a billion dollars by 2030 and will push food prices even higher. Will the Liberals scrap the Senate amendments, remove the carbon tax from agriculture and make food more affordable for everyone? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Madam Speaker, we know that farmers actually see the brunt of climate change and natural disasters day to day. And that is what is increasing food prices when we see how they are being impacted by natural disasters. We are actually taking action to fight climate change and at the same time support farmers. In each instance where we were supporting farmers in the last, in the last votes, the Conservatives voted against. They voted against. $25 million going to Fort McMurray Cold Lake to support agricultural workers in that field. Why are they standing against supporting farmers to fight climate change? The Honourable Member for Yellowhead. With an answer like that, I'm not surprised Canadians can't afford food in a country where 2 million citizens are relying on food banks monthly. It's baffling to see the NDP Liberal Coalition push to quadruple the carbon tax. When you tax the farmer that grows the food and the trucker who delivers the food, Canadians are stuck with higher food prices. Bill C-234 in its original form promises immediate relief. Will the Liberals discard the Senate's alterations, lift this tax burden and help Canadians afford their groceries already? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Madam Speaker. The first thing that the Conservatives did when the last time they formed government was to get rid of childcare right across our country. That impacts affordability. We have a national childcare program that's reducing the cost of childcare to $10 a day. They were sending $100 checks to millionaires. We brought in Canada Child Benefit that gives up to $619 a month to the people who need it the most. In each instance, we're there to support families to put food on the table. They are not. Worst possible thing. The Honourable Member for Terrebonne. Madam Speaker, the January 18th deadline to repay the SEBA loans without penalties shows the federal government's lack of consideration for entrepreneurs. The Liberals even celebrated this week the fact that 80 percent of small businesses paid the money back on time. This means, according to their calculations, that 20 percent are unable to repay the loan. One in five small businesses who took out the SEBA loan is at risk of going bankrupt, and the Liberals think that that is good news. Do the Liberals think that 180,000 bankruptcies is a good news story? The Honourable Minister. 
Thank you, Madam Speaker. Once again, we are here in a number of ways for small businesses. Uh, yes, the SIBA was very important during COVID. We extended the loan period, uh, the loan itself, and there was a non-refundable amount. 80% of those who took out the loan have already repaid it. There are other measures to repay the loan. There are three years, and it's 5% interest. Uh, there's a lot of other measures, and I would say that if we didn't have this uh, subsidy for wages, then a lot of businesses would have gone bankrupt. The Honourable Member for Terban. Madam Speaker, while the Liberals are patting themselves on the back, they are ignoring the sacrifices made by those who made the reimbursement. There are people who dangerously drew on their lines of credit. They put their own homes on the line, all because Ottawa is refusing to assess case by case. They're refusing to guarantee loans with financial institutions um, because they are stubbornly adding 20,000 in debt to companies already on the verge of the abyss. Uh, would it hurt so much to show consideration and flexibility for our businesses? Uh, the Honourable Minister of National Revenue. Once again, thank you, Madam Speaker. During COVID, had we not been there with SIBA, and the wage subsidy with the rent assistance, thousands of small businesses would not have made it through the pandemic. Uh, the economy is recovering. We have very reasonable conditions in place for repayment. 80% have already repaid. They have until the end of March still. And for those that will have to extend by three years, it's only 5% interest that will be paid. So $250 maximum a month. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Member for Central Okanagan, Similkaneen Nicola. <laughs> Madam Speaker, after eight years of this NDP Liberal government, so many of my residents struggle to pay for gas and groceries, particularly seniors on fixed income, single parents, persons with disabilities. We can fight this made-in-Canada inflation by supporting the Conservative leader's motion to cancel the April 1st carbon tax increase. Will the Liberal and NDP caucus members vote to stop this increase to help struggling Canadians, or will the Prime Minister simply whip the ball? Here, here. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Well, Madam Speaker, it seems the Conservatives have some explaining to do while they're taking acting classes, talking about the plight and affordability of Canadians, the official leader of the opposition's chief strategist is getting rich off of the backs of Loblaws as a lobbyist. And Madam Speaker, I think we now know while the Conservatives act for their videos and clips, yet they're voting against Canadians' interests and affordability and competition for grocery prices. Madam Speaker, while they take acting classes, we're acting. Lo the Honourable Member for Central Okanagan, Samilkan and Nicholas. Uh, the only one that's acting here is, is, is us on this side being responsible and saying what our constituents are feeling. Now, the Prime Minister recognized the pain his carbon tax caused and exempted home heating oil from the last fall. But this didn't occur in my home province. The B.C. government said that they wanted a similar exemption for home heating oil from this NDP Liberal government to their climate plan. I support the Conservative leader's common sense plan to axe the tax for all Canadians, Madam Speaker, but at the very least, British Columbia should be treated fairly. If B.C. requests it, will the Prime Minister approve their request? Here, here. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary, the Minister of Environment. Madam Speaker, British Columbia has been a leader in fighting climate change. In fact, they brought a price on carbon pollution before the federal government did, and they have been a true partner all throughout every step. We will continue to work with the province of British Columbia to make sure that they can support Canadians. They have the Greener Homes Grants and other programs where we continue to support every measure that Canadians do to have cleaner fuel. Thanks. The Honourable Member for Calgary Confederation. Madam Speaker, a tax on a farmer is a tax on food. It's that simple. Canadians know rising carbon taxes make everything more expensive. And they overwhelmingly know that after eight years, this NDP Liberal government is not worth the cost. Conservatives know a carbon tax hike on April 1st will make food even more unaffordable. That is why we put forward a sensible motion to cancel this tax hike. Do the Liberals even know that their carbon tax hike will continue to drive up the cost of food? Here, here. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. It's, uh, it's a bit funny that the members are talking about affordability on that side. I think my honourable colleague has brought a, a good point. Uh, the chief strategist for the leader of the official opposition is a lobbyist for Loblaws. 
Loblaws is the only grocer asking to not be part of the grocery code of conduct, something that the uh, Conservatives were supportive. They were, they were supportive of the grocery code of conduct. Now I'm asking, is this an official policy of the Conservative Can Party of Canada that they're no longer supporting the grocery code of conduct because their chief strategist is a lobbyist for Loblaws? The Honourable Member for Calgary Confederation. Madam Speaker, this uh, government just doesn't understand how badly Canadians are struggling, including my city of Calgary. Statistics Canada recently reported that it costs more to afford basic goods and live a moderate standard of living in Calgary than any other major city in Canada. It now costs more to live in Calgary than it does in Toronto or Vancouver. Will the Liberals stop their April 1st carbon tax increase that will make gas, groceries and home heating even more expensive or will they pile on more costs to Calgarians? Here, here. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. We have worked, as you know, Madam Speaker, with the City of Calgary on a range of matters, including getting more housing built through the Housing Accelerator Fund. But I find the hypocrisy in the Conservative position stunning. They continue to talk about the vulnerable, where we know what they would do if they were in office. They would cut pensions, they would cut EI. The Canada Child Benefit, it would be cut. Dental care, child care, they've never been for it, Madam Speaker. They talk about the homelessness. Be serious, Madam Speaker. They don't believe in dealing with homelessness because every time they've had a chance to vote for measures that would deal with it, they voted against it as recently as a few weeks ago. They're not serious, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for Edmonton, Grisbach. Gaza is the most dangerous place to be a journalist. 122 journalists have been killed in Netanyahu's onslaught. Mansoor Schumann, a brave reporter in Gaza, a Canadian and a fellow Albertan, has been missing for over a a week. Eyewitnesses say he is taken into custody by the Israeli army. His mother is worried sick and says the government hasn't done enough to keep her informed about his whereabouts. Can the government commit to Mansoor Schumann's mother and all his loved ones that they will do everything in their power to bring him home? The Honourable Parliament, the Secretary of the Minister of Foreign Affairs. Thank you, Honourable Member, for raising this issue today and for many members who have sent me uh, concerns about this particular case. When it comes to this case, I want to state very clearly that consular officials at Global Affairs, as well as uh, in the field, have been in touch with the family. The minister herself talked to the family this week and have assured the family that we are doing everything we can to find out this person's whereabouts. We are considering every possibility of, of engagement on this case. We will continue to do that. I'm not able to go into further details due to privacy concerns, but if you have more concerns or questions, please contact me directly. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Victoria. Madam Speaker, Canadians can't keep up with their home heating costs. Switching to a heat pump makes life more affordable while tackling the climate crisis. But the current Liberal program is riddled with problems and almost impossible for rural and lower income Canadians to access. The Liberals have threatened to cancel this program and are leaving people out in the cold with higher home heating bills and no option to switch. This makes no sense. Why won't the Liberals make big oil pay what they owe and use the funds to fix the heat pump? program. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Madam Speaker, it is an absolutely amazing thing to see how popular the Greener Homes Grant has been as well as the Greener Homes Loans. Right. Canadians across the country have been taking this opportunity to better insulate their home and switch to heat pumps, all of which reduces their bills, their heat bills at the end of the day, at the same time as protecting our environment. We have a continued com commitment to work towards green buildings right across our country. We will be having an update soon. Please watch for it. The Honourable Member for Vaughan Woodbridge. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, earlier this week I had the pleasure of joining the Ministers of Justice and Public Safety in York Region to announce $121 million in funding to combat guns, gangs and organized crime in Ontario. In the city of Vaughan and in many big cities across the country, auto theft is a growing problem and one that's becoming increasingly violent. Can the Minister of Public Safety please reassure my constituents and all Canadians and tell us how the government plans to tackle this issue? Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you to the member for Vaughan Woodbridge for standing up for safety in his community and joining the Minister of Public Safety to address auto theft, which is a serious problem that requires collaboration and an all-hands-on-deck approach with our provincial and municipal partners. Canadians are understandably concerned for their safety, and they expect a 
elected officials to put their partisanship aside and work together. That's why our government is working with local partners, including the police, while the leader of the opposition insults the individuals who have taken an oath. The Honourable Member for Parry Sound Muskoka. After eight years of this NDP Liberal government, the doom and gloom in the housing market is worse than ever. Fewer homes were built last year than the year before. Vacancy rates are at all-time highs, or all-time lows rather, and rent is at all-time high. Instead of removing the gatekeepers that block buildings, the Liberals cut them big checks. In fact, the first four photo ops this housing ministers took cost Canadians $300 million. How much longer will we be cutting big checks before a single home gets approved or even built? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary for the Minister of Housing. Madam Speaker, I have a good rapport with the colleague opposite. We work together on the HUMA Committee, but it's hard to take him seriously in this House today when we know that recently he's voted against 99 units of housing for his own community. At, five, at 520 Isaac Street, he can go down. I'm sure he knows where that is. 99 units of, units of housing have been built as a result of this government's funding. And that's what the National Housing Strategy is doing across the country. We've seen 125,000 people who are very close to being homeless off the streets. 70,000 people who were homeless off the street with wraparound supports. We're going to... The Honourable Member for Paris, Muskoka. Now, Mr. Speaker, what's hard to take serious is that parliamentary secretary because he knows full well that these big expensive photo ops in Mississauga and Toronto, for example, more housing than ever, is getting blocked despite them. Merely weeks, weeks after the Prime Minister's $471 million photo op in Toronto, the gatekeepers there said no to new housing right next door to a new transit station. Ooh. Mississauga got a big $313 million check after having blocked 17,000 units in 2023. This photo op Prime Minister is failing Canadians. He's not worth the cost. And so when will this government stop buying housing photo ops and start delivering housing? The Honourable oh. Parliamentary Secretary. If he wants to see the results of the National Housing Strategy, Again, I remind him, go down to 520 Isaac Street in his riding. He can see the results, 99 units of housing. As far as the other points raised, he's talking about the Housing Accelerator Fund. Yes, we've concluded agreements with 30 communities that will incent change, zoning change that leads to the construction of duplexes, triplexes, fourplexes, mid-rise apartments and row houses and more. That's how we get Canadians housed. That's how we bring down costs. And Madam Speaker, they want to put taxes on the construction of apartments. In addition, they want to continue measures that will not go ahead with more housing built in this country. The Honourable Member for Mali Lille, Kamouraska Rivière du Loup. Madam Speaker, in the Lower St. Lawrence region, after eight years of this government, the vacancy rate is incredibly low and rents are skyrocketing. There are increases of up to 10% or even more. This is very conserving. It's higher than the inflation rate, higher than the increase in wages. That means that rental households will get poorer. Why isn't this government doing something to make rents go down? The Honourable Government House Leader. Well, do you know what won't help construct new rental housing? As the member knows, their policy to bring back GST on new rental housing builds. That's their policy. It's in their bill. That's their leader, leader's proposal. Builders are telling me that this GST change will enable thousands of new units to be built. I hope my colleague will look into that. The Honourable Member. Madam Speaker, the Governor of the Bank of Canada said yesterday that government expenses, spending rather, will keep inflation and possibly interest rates high, which will increase home costs and mortgage renewal costs, as well as rents. After eight years, this government still doesn't seem to understand that balancing the budget within a predictable time frame would simply be a common sense measure. Will this government take measures to get back to a balanced budget as soon as possible? In the next budget, in fact. Well, it's very interesting to see what the Conservative Party's history on this is. Deficit is the story of the Conservative Party. In fact, what do we see now? A AAA credit rating, the lowest debt to GDP ratio in the G7. We rank third in the OECD, Madam Speaker, when it comes to attracting foreign direct investment. 
Deal after deal has been concluded by the Minister of Industry, including in my region of southwestern Ontario and St. Thomas specifically in Windsor, yep. to see electric vehicle battery plants built. That gets Canadians working. Of course, we see also a very low unemployment rate, Madam Speaker. Honourable député de Beauport. Mon Dieu. Beauport. The Honourable Member for Beauport, Côte Beaupré, Lille d'Orléans, Charlevoix. Thank you. After four press conferences promising good news in January, the Minister of Fisheries has ultimately fallen way short of expectations. It's all very well to talk about opening up the rockfish fishery, but actually 60% of that will go to 30 meter ships, which actually is the only transition plan after drastically cutting shrimp quotas to a mere 3,060 tons to share with the Maritimes. That's nothing. There's no long-term vision here, neither to protect resources or the ecosystem. What will the minister do about this? Is she planning to end fishing in Quebec? Well, Madam Speaker, the situation for shrimp fishermen in the St. Lawrence is disastrous. Everyone agrees here that no one wants to fish the last shrimp. That's why, after a number of consultations, I announced a lowering of quotas for shrimp. That will enable shrimp stocks to rise again at a time where we're facing climate change. Our government will continue to offer solutions to our fishers, such as permit twinning. The honorable member. Well, given that there is a large amount of rockfish, which preys on small fish and shrimp, there's a real lack of vision here, and it shows a lack of consideration for the expertise of fishers. Fishers expect a real transition plan. Like things were 30 years ago, things have gone backwards since then. A plan with financial compensation, a marketing strategy for rockfish and new projects, products, and concrete alternatives for pelagic species, seals, seaweed, shrimp, and deep sea fish. When will the minister finally propose a sustainable plan? The Honourable Minister, Madam Speaker, announcing the opening of the commercial rockfish fishery in 2024 after 30 years of a moratorium is great news. This is Groundhog Day all over again. And I guess that the Bloc Québécois is taking advantage of Groundhog Day to come out of its hole because, after all, for six months they haven't asked a single question about fisheries. The only thing that's entirely clear is that Fisheries only matter to the Bloc Québécois when they can find votes at the end of their fishing line. Kelowna Lake Country. Madam Speaker, children under 18 in British Columbia can now be prescribed fentanyl. It's reported parents don't even need to be told or agree. Toxic drug overdose is now the leading cause of death for youth in British Columbia. It's also reported addiction experts have criticized protocols citing they are deeply inadequate and do not provide a minimum age for when youth can receive recreational fentanyl. Will this NDP Liberal government put an end to their dangerous drug policy experiments, putting deadly fentanyl into the hands of the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Health? Thank you, Madam Speaker. Conservatives are trying to spread fear and confusion. Here are the facts. No kids have been prescribed fentanyl in BC. Under the guidelines, there are additional precautions in place when it comes to prescribing the two minors. The most important relationship in managing one's health is with the health care provider. Arm reduction is health care. We are working to save lives. The Honourable Member for Kelowna Lake Country. Well, Madam Speaker, yesterday was absolutely shocking when first BC's top doctor said so-called safe supply is landing into street-level trafficking and ending up in the hands of children. Then the Liberal Minister responsible for safe supply came to committee and doubled down on the Liberal NDP unwavering commitment to their deadly drug policy experiments. It's absolutely unbelievable. The government's addictive drugs end up in our kids' hands and the government endorses it. Will the NDP Liberal government end their deadly drug policy experiment and get the drugs out of our kids' hands? The 
The Secretary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Prescribed safe supply is a valued intervention and a necessary life-saving intervention. It helps connect to social supports and it is part of the continuum of care. We take the safety of all Canadians seriously and will continue to approach the toxic drugs and overdose crisis from both a public health and public safety perspective. The yeah, Honourable Member for Sarnia Lambton. Madam Speaker, after eight years of this Liberal NDP government, crime is up nearly 40 per cent across the country. The Liberals removed jail time for car theft in Bill C-5, and since then, car theft is up 300 per cent in Toronto and 34 per cent overall in Canada. This Prime Minister is not worth the cost or the crime. Every six minutes, a car is stolen. Insurance rates have risen as much as 50 per cent at a time when Canadians can least afford it. Common sense Conservatives will bring back jail, not bail, for criminals. Will the Liberals? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Madam Speaker, it's interesting how the Conservatives are just waking up to the issue of auto theft in this country. This is something we have been working on with our local partners, including police. And Madam Speaker, while the Conservatives sit here and talk tough to the cameras just over 50 days ago. They actually voted against over $80 million that would go precisely to combat the issues that that member is raising. Madam Speaker, they talk tough, but there's no action when it comes to actually dealing with crime in this country. Honorable Député de Saint-Léonard Saint-Michel. The Honorable Member for Saint-Léonard Saint-Michel. Madam Speaker, we know that families throughout the country are facing an increase in the cost of living, including in my riding, saint lenel saint michel The Canada Child Benefit is a source of support for families in my community. Can the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Families and Children tell the House about the impact that this important policy is having for Canadian families? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'd like to thank my colleague for this important question. We know that many people are indeed facing a difficult financial situation, and that's why we have brought in programs like the Canada Child Benefit, which was designed to support the most vulnerable among us. The Canada Child Benefit has lifted hundreds of thousands of children out of poverty since 2016. It is indexed to the cost of living. Parents will now receive up to $7,437 per child under six years old, and up to $6,275 for children up to 17. This support is essential. St. Albert, Edmonton. Madam Speaker, after eight years, this NDP Liberal government isn't worth the cost or the corruption. The Minister of Industry conveniently claims that until recently he had no idea about corruption and self-dealing at the Liberals' billion-dollar green slush fund. But we now know that his predecessor, Navdeep Baines, was informed as early as 2019 that the company of the Liberal appointed chair had received millions from the fund in a blatant conflict of interest. So in the face of that, how is it possible that the Minister had no idea? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Speaker, let me be clear. As soon as we found out about these allegations, alleged allegations, the Department of I said acted quickly. The Minister of Innovation has already accepted the resignation of the CEO and the Chair. We take these allegations extremely seriously, which is why we are following proper due diligence. Our government is committed to ensure that organizations which receive um, government funding adhere to the highest standards of governance. We are committed to getting to the bottom of these allegations. Thank you. Honourable Member for St. Albert Edmonton. Madam Speaker, nonsense. Not only had the Minister's predecessor been informed of self-dealing on the part of the Liberal appointed chair, the Minister sent officials to attend each Green Slush Fund board meeting in which board members funneled more than 20 million taxpayers' dollars to their own companies. And the Minister claims he had no idea Either the minister is grossly incompetent or he is misleading Canadians. Which is it? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Speaker, this is just another example of the Conservatives willing to say anything to oppose us fighting climate change. This includes that you know, they want to slash the funding to this organization that this Parliament in this House voted for over 20 years ago. We're sticking to the facts and to the due process. We'll continue fighting to get to the bottom of this. Thank you very much, Speaker. The Honourable Member for Calgary, Rocky Ridge. <laughs> Madam Speaker, on April 1st, this Liberal NDP government is going to automatically 
raise the tax on beer, wine and spirits for the eighth year in a row without even a vote from elected MPs. When a simple treat like sharing a bottle of wine with a loved one becomes unaffordable, Canadians know that after eight years this Prime Minister is not worth the cost. Will the Prime Minister stop this automatic annual tax increase and bring back happy hour for Canadians? Yeah. 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 The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Madam Speaker, we'll continue to work with the beer sector, with Vinters, to ensure that they are competitive. And in fact, if we look at the wider Canadian economy, what do we see? A lower unemployment rate than existed before the pandemic. There's more jobs working now than before the pandemic. That party continues to put forward an austerity agenda that would do what? Cut pensions, cut EI, cut the Canada Child Benefit, dental care, child care, all of it. They don't believe in the social programs that have upheld this country in so many different ways. They don't believe in it by Canadians by extension. That's what I have to say to that member. The Honourable Member for West Vancouver, Sunshine Coast, C2 Sky Country. <laughs> Madam Speaker, the federal government can get more housing built by working with municipalities rather than insulting mayors like the leader of the official opposition does. Through the Housing Accelerator Fund, we're working with the District of Squamish to fast-track the construction of an additional 200 homes over the next three years and over 1,300 homes over the next decade. And these are not just any homes. These are affordable, rental and missing middle homes that the municipality has determined are badly needed in the community. Can the Parliamentary Secretary of Housing, Infrastructure and Communities please tell residents of Squamish how we're working with local partners to get more housing built faster at prices that they can afford? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. I'm happy to do exactly that, Madam Speaker, but let me first say that that member, his tireless advocacy led to agreements like the one completed with Squamish. And in fact, other MPs on this side have worked also to ensure outcomes through the Housing Accelerator Fund. I talked about it before, but it bears repeating. This is a fund that ensures incentives on municipalities' part to change zoning, zoning that will lead to more building in return for federal funding. What do we see as a result? duplexes, fourplexes, triplexes, mid-rise apartments. All of these will lead to 500,000 homes built, being built over the next decade and 78,000 homes built over the next four years. That's how we get housing going. The Honourable Member for Churchill, Coetanook, Aski. Northern Manitoba is seeing temperatures above zero. We've had weather that's unheard of these last two months. Thousands of people in our region depend on ice roads to survive. Because of the warm weather, some roads haven't opened and others will not last the season. The Liberals have failed to act quickly to combat the climate emergency that is hitting Indigenous communities the hardest. Yeah. Investments in climate adaptation are needed now. An airport for Wasagamac, all weather roads for St. Teresa Point, Oxford House and York Landing. When will the Liberals finally act to deliver these life-saving investments? Here, here. Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. I'd like to thank the member opposite for her question and her uh, dedication to this file. Indeed, Indigenous people all across Canada, and especially in northern areas, are feeling the brunt of climate change faster than other areas. Uh, I was at the United Nations last year where they told our government this, and our government is willing to work with their community and work with Indigenous communities to make sure that they have all the services that all Canadians have in Canada. Thank you very much. Great answer. The Honourable Member for Richmond North Basca. Mr. Speaker, Madam Speaker, rather, on December 2nd, 2022, on February 15th, March 23rd, and September 25th, 2023, I asked questions about an outdated tax law that's been around for 30 years. It means that Canadian businesses are penalized by our tax system, even though they're using local and healthy products. Things are getting more and more expensive, and it's harder for families to eat healthy products. By doing something about the situation, the government would be helping families buy healthy f and cheaper food, and it would end this injustice, which means that SMEs are fighting multinationals in an unfair manner. Will the finance minister finally do something about this? The Honourable Minister of National Revenue, Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'd like to thank my colleague. And I believe we should all work together to solve this situation. We want to support our local businesses and help them exist in a good business environment. This is a complex issue, and we can't solve it overnight, but we will continue to work with him. Well, that's all the time for question period today. Good to see you all.